Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the reproductive system. Um, this is the second video in the reproductive system lecture, and this is going to be specifically focusing on the female reproductive system. The functions of the female reproductive system are one, to produce the female sex hormones. Um, this is estrogen, or this includes estrogens and progesterones. Um, and these are the hormones that are responsible for um, maintaining the function of the female reproductive system, as well as um, kind of creating and supporting all of the secondary characteristics, sex characteristics of a female. So when you look at somebody and you know that they're a female versus a male, that's usually because of their secondary sex characteristics. So like the deposition of hair in certain areas or not having hair in certain areas. Um, the depth of the voice, um, the deposition of fat in specific areas. Um, so women tend to have more fat in the breast area as well as in the hips and gluteal region, as opposed to men tend to deposit fat more in the belly region, um, and that's hormonal. Um, so the female reproductive system produces these female sex hormones as well as functional gametes. Um, the functional gamete is the egg um, or the oocyte, um, but the oocyte is just a fancy word for the egg, um, and that egg is the female gamete. Remember the spermatocyte or the sperm was the male gamete, um, and those two things join together to produce offspring. Um, the production of the sex hormones and the production of the oocyte occurs in the female ovaries. Um, these are the, the female glands um, of the reproductive system, equivalent to what we saw as testes in the male. The female reproductive system is not done after producing and releasing the egg or oocyte. Um, when we looked at the male reproductive system, we saw that they produced the sperm, they released the sperm, and then they were done. Um, that's not the case with the female reproductive system. The female reproductive system is much more complex um, because not only does it produce the gamete in order to allow you know, reproduction to occur, but after the egg and sperm have met up and um, cells start dividing to produce an embryo, the female reproductive system retains that embryo um, and protects and supports the developing embryo as it becomes a fetus, um, which continues to grow and develop into eventually um, we have an infant. Um, this you know, protection of the developing embryo occurs in the uterus of the female reproductive system. Um, the female reproductive system then takes place or takes part in the birthing process where this infant moves from the uterus um, down through the birth canal and out into the world. And the female body is still not done. Um, because then the female reproductive system has the ability to continue to nourish this newborn infant um, for up to like, like the first year of life. Um, that's what's typically recommended. Um, and the way that they do that is via the breasts of the female reproductive system, where we'll see there are lactiferous um, you know, glands and ducts where milk production occurs. All right, so we're gonna talk about each of these um, parts of the female reproductive system in more detail, um, starting with the ovaries. So women have a pair of ovaries. There are two ovaries, which are relatively small, almond-shaped glands that are no located near the lateral walls of the pelvic cavity. Um, remember from lab that the ovaries are located on either side of the uterus. Um, again, laterally positioned on the, the sides of the pelvic cavity. The ovaries have three major functions. Um, one, the ovaries are where the egg is produced. So the ovaries take part in the production of the immature female gamete or oocyte. Again, fancy word for um, what the, the layperson would say, egg. Um, the ovaries are also uh, glands that are responsible for the secretion of the female sex hormones. So this is where we see estrogens and progestins produced. 
um, these hormones, estrogen and progestin, are going to be responsible for the activities that we see occurring in the uterus. Um, they're responsible for the, the uterine cycle that occurs each month. Um, we also see that the ovaries um, secrete a hormone called inhibin, and inhibin is involved in negative feedback control of follicle-stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland. Um, follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, remember is released from the anterior pituitary gland. And it's released in response to GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about FSH quite a bit as we go through this, um, through this lecture. But for right now, um, just know that one of the things that can control the release of um, follicle stimulating hormone, or one of the things that can inhibit the release of follicle stimulating hormone um, is inhibin, which again comes from the ovaries. We're gonna talk in detail about ogenesis. Um, ogenesis, or it's also called ovum production. Um, this is just egg production or the production of the oocyte um, in the female. Um, genesis is, um, remember, giving rise to, so like creation. So this is the creation of the oocyte um, or creation of the egg. Um, oogenesis or egg production is very different from the sperm production that we saw in the male reproductive system. Uh, remember that sperm production starts at puberty and once the male starts producing sperm, they continuously produce sperm just around the clock, um, pretty much through life. Um, and even a very old gentleman um, still is producing some sperm. Um, <clears throat> sperm production is relatively quick, again, just kind of continuously making more sperm and then getting rid of them. Um, the production of the egg is just different in a lot of different ways. First off, the production of all eggs that a woman will ever have starts before she's even born. So egg production or oogenesis begins before birth in the fetus. So when the female fetus is developing in the womb, she starts making all eggs that she will ever have. So when a female baby is born, she already has all of the eggs that she'll ever be able to produce. They're not mature yet, like they're not done being made. They're like in suspended animation, they're paused in their production. But when a female baby is born, she already has all of the eggs she will ever have. Um, which is very interesting. So production of eggs, oogenesis, begins before birth in the fetus, and then it pauses during fetal development. So all of the eggs start being made, and then in the fetus, in the womb, they stop, and then the baby's born with all of the eggs kind of halfway made. Then nothing happens for a while, and the production of these eggs resumes again at puberty. So um, when the girl hits puberty, um, and, you know, her menstrual cycle starts, um, that kind of kickstarts the production of eggs. Um, and what happens is every month, um, one egg will finish being made. Um, one of those eggs will finish that, that production that started a long time ago um, and will be released. Um, and the next month, another egg will finish being produced and will be released. Um, so that that resuming of egg production um, or oogenesis that starts at puberty continues in a monthly ovarian cycle. It continues in this cyclical fashion each month, which we'll talk about. This happens um, where an egg is made each month um, until menopause. And then at menopause, um, the egg production or oogenesis stops. And after menopause, the female reproductive system does not make any eggs anymore, right? So this is different from males in a lot of different ways, key differences. 
One, it starts before birth. Two, there's a set number that gets released each month, right? One egg gets finished, you know, made to completion and gets released each month. Males start at puberty and they produce millions of sperm, right? Millions and millions and millions of sperm. It's not just, you know, a set number every month. Finally, with females, this process ends at menopause and then that's it. Um, with males, it continues until late in life. They just keep making sperm until very late in life. So we're gonna look at this production um, of the oocyte, right? We're gonna look at oogenesis in detail, look at the way, you know, on a, at a cellular level, the way that the eggs are produced. Um, <clears throat> so first we have mitosis of the ogonium. Um, the ogonium is the stem cell of the like oocyte, right? The stem cell that's going to end up giving us all of our eggs. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing that happens is we have mitosis of that stem cell. Mitosis, remember, is a cell division where the daughter cells that are produced have a full set of chromosomes. So both daughter cells have 46 chromosomes, the full set. Um, and we refer to that as diploid. I remember cells, when you have cell division, the cells that you make can be diploid or haploid. Haploid is when they only have half the chromosomes. Um, diploid is when they have the full set of chromosomes. Um, <clears throat> so first we have you know, mitosis of the ogonium, the stem cell. And um, when the ogonium divides, it's gonna give us two cells that are identical to each other. Um, one of them, remains the ogonium. It remains the stem cell that's gonna keep doing the same thing to give us more and more and more and more eggs. Um, the other cell that, that goes on and continues in this, um, continues in this like, you know, division and maturing into the actual egg is called the primary oocyte. So we go from the stem cell to the primary oocyte, which again is still diploid. It still has a full set of 46 chromosomes. This mitosis of the ogonium is happening in a fetus, okay? So this is happening before birth. When the fetus is in the womb developing the eggs, we produce our primary oocyte. Okay, <clears throat> so the next thing that happens, right? Our ogonium underwent mitosis and gave us a primary oocyte. Now, the next thing that happens in egg production is meiosis, right? Not mitosis, but meiosis. Remember, meiosis is the cell division that happens in our sex cells, right? So in the egg and the sperm, um, when they divide, they go through meiosis. Um, and meiosis has two divisions involved, right? There's gonna be meiosis one, and meiosis two. And eventually at the end of that, we're gonna end up with a cell that has half the number of chromosomes as the parent cell. We're gonna end up with a haploid cell. But remember again, that involves two divisions in order for us to get there. Meiosis one and then meiosis two. So now first we're gonna look at what happens with meiosis one. Meiosis one, um, ultimately is gonna involve the primary oocyte dividing and producing the secondary oocyte. Um, now this process begins um, between the third and seventh month of fetal development. So again, this is meiosis one starts in the fetus. Okay? <clears throat> so somewhere between the third and seventh month of fetal development, the primary oocyte in the ovary of the fetus starts going through meiosis one. Um, again, the first cell division in meiosis. However, the eggs do not actually complete the process. They start the cell division of meiosis one and then it stops. The process gets you know, suspended in time until puberty.
um, <clears throat> these cells, so like all of the eggs at that point in time, when the baby is born, all of the eggs um, that are suspended in the middle of meiosis one, we call those primordial follicles. So when the baby is born inside the ovaries, she has primordial follicles. These have the um, primary oocytes in the middle of meiosis one, right? So they're, they're in the middle of developing into secondary oocytes, but they haven't completed the process yet. We'll go back to this term primordial follicle, um, you know, a little bit later. We'll go back to that momentarily. So when puberty begins, right? So the second part here is after puberty. When puberty begins, um, there are increasing levels of FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, from the anterior pituitary. FSH triggers the start of the ovarian cycle when these eggs can finish meiosis one and continue their development. Right, so it's increasing in increases in FSH at puberty that will you know start the ovarian cycle. So each month, right, this cycle is going to repeat, um, but each month or each cycle, some of these primary oocytes will be stimulated to finish meiosis one. Okay, right? those cells that are that are chosen to finish meiosis one will end up turning into secondary oocytes. Okay, this will, will yield a secondary oocyte. Now note, secondary oocytes are still diploid. Okay, this is still a cell that has a full set of 46 chromosomes. Now note, um, note here that like I'm not showing two secondary oocytes. Okay, when this primary oocyte goes through meiosis, remember there's going to be two divisions. There's going to be meiosis one and meiosis two. When it goes through these cell divisions, it does not produce, you know, two viable cells each time. So like when this primary oocyte divides, it produces a secondary oocyte, and then what we call a polar body, which is not a viable cell. Okay, this is different than sperm. With the sperm, every time they divide, we made you know more and more viable cells, but we're only going to end up with one viable egg out of this process, not four. Okay, which again, with sperm, you have a cell, it divides into two, and then each of those divide into two, and you end up with four spermatocytes, right, for sperm. That is not the case with the egg. Okay, with the egg, we're only going to end up with one viable cell and then three polar bodies that are not viable. Okay, so this starts in the fetus, right, and the fetus, in the fetus, we have a primary oocyte, and then that primary oocyte starts meiosis one and it pauses. Then at puberty, there's an increase in FSH, some of these cells end up being chosen to complete meiosis one, and we end up with the secondary oocyte. The next step is meiosis two, right? This is the second division that occurs in meiosis because meiosis, cell division in our sex cells, involves two cell divisions, right? Two splitting of cells. Meiosis one just happened, that gave us our secondary oocyte. Now that secondary oocyte, right, this is like during the ovarian cycle, right, the ovarian cycle that happens at puberty. During that ovarian cycle, um, <clears throat> that cell that just turned into a secondary oocyte is going to start meiosis two, but it's not going to finish meiosis two. Um, the cell starts meiosis two, right, so it begins meiosis two, and then it pauses again, right? It gets suspended in the middle or stopped in the middle of meiosis two. And that secondary oocyte that's in the middle of meiosis two is what gets released from the ovary. So at ovulation, when the ovary releases the egg, it's not actually an egg that's completely developed. 
it is a secondary oocyte that's suspended in the middle of meiosis II. That's what gets released from the ovary. Um, now, that secondary oocyte that gets released in the middle of meiosis II will only get completed if fertilization occurs. So if the egg actually gets fertilized by sperm, then it will, that will stimulate it to finish meiosis II and develop into a mature ovum or a mature egg, which is actually a haploid cell, right? This has 23 chromosomes. It has half the number of chromosomes. Um, also notice here, we have three polar bodies. Um, the polar bodies are just gonna degenerate. They're not actually like usable cells. Um, and remember like where those are all coming from. We had our primary oocyte. The primary oocyte divides into a secondary oocyte and then a polar body. The secondary oocyte divides and it gives us, you know, our mature cell and a polar body. Um, over here on this side, this polar body, it can divide again. It can complete meiosis too, and that gives us two polar bodies. So what we end up with is, you know, three polar bodies that are not viable and one mature ovum. Again, this is just the process again, um, but in, in you know, words instead of pictures. So again, this process of oogenesis or egg production, um, <clears throat> it starts with the ogonium and in the fetus, the ogonium divides via mitosis, right? So normal cell division, it divides and it gives us a primary oocyte. That primary oocyte has a full set of um, chromosomes. Between the third and seventh months of fetal development, so still in the fetus, that primary oocyte begins meiosis, okay, which is going to involve two cell divisions, meiosis one and meiosis two. So that primary oocyte begins meiosis one, but it stops. Okay, It stops in prophase. I don't care that you know the specific phase of cell division, but it stops in the middle of its cell division um, in the middle of meiosis one. And that's it, it's just paused there. So when the baby's born, all of her eggs are suspended in the middle of meiosis one. Now that they remain, all of the oocytes remain suspended until puberty. At puberty, we have an increase in FSH, follicle stimulating hormone that comes from the anterior pituitary gland. And that follicle stimulating hormone is gonna start the ovarian cycle. Each month from that point forward, some of these primary oocytes will be stimulated to continue their development, where again, the primary oocyte will develop into a secondary oocyte, and then that secondary oocyte will start to go through meiosis II and be released from the ovary. If it's fertilized, it will finish meiosis II and develop into a mature egg. Um, and one thing, remember that when these primary oocytes that are like in the middle of meiosis one, um, when the baby is born, those primary oocytes in the middle of meiosis one, they're stored in primordial follicles. So they're in little follicles, right? Just waiting to be stimulated to continue developing. Notice this hormone is follicle stimulating hormone. It stimulates the follicle to continue its development. So there are um, a couple important things to remember about meiosis of the oocyte. So about the cell division of the egg. Um, one, the cytoplasm of the primary oocyte divides unevenly. Again, um, when that primary oocyte is going through meiosis one, when the primary oocyte is dividing, um, it doesn't divide evenly. It produces one ovum, 
right, with like the original cytoplasm, one viable cell, and two or three polar bodies. Okay, so again, not just meiosis one, that's meiosis one and two. So like when the primary oocyte goes through each of its cell divisions, at the end of all of that, you produce one ovum, right, that has all the goods, all the good stuff, and then two or three polar bodies that are not viable, they're not usable, they just disintegrate. So like the point here is that all of the nutrients, all of the focus, all of the stuff goes into one egg. Um, it's like you put all your eggs, all your eggs in one basket. With the sperm, remember you end up producing four little sperm and that's fine. But in this case, we need everything to go into that one single egg. Um, <clears throat> also, um, another important point is the ovary releases the secondary oocyte, not a mature egg, right? not a mature ovum. Um, the secondary oocyte that's being released from the ovary at ovulation is suspended in meiosis II. So it's, it hasn't completed this, the, this, the last cell division of meiosis. It's not done yet. Um, the meiosis is completed when the egg gets fertilized. Um, it only gets completed upon fertilization of the egg. Otherwise, the, the egg will never actually be mature. It will get shed during menses when the rest of the uterus is shed or when the endometrium of the uterus is shed. Okay, <clears throat> so female reproduction, okay, like the functioning of the female reproductive system involves two cycles, um, two like monthly cycles that work together with each other. The ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle. Okay? These are very complex cycles and they're integrated with each other. So um, <clears throat> we'll start with the ovarian cycle. Um, the ovarian cycle refers to the monthly series of events that occur in the ovaries um, during and after the maturation of the oocyte. So it's like what's happening in the ovary as we choose that one oocyte to continue its development and be released and then what continues to happen after that. Um, so ovarian cycle is what's happening in the ovaries. So after puberty begins, um, again, after puberty begins, because of this, this FSH that, that's released from the pituitary gland, um, a different group of primordial follicles is activated each month. Um, <clears throat> this process is controlled by hormones from the anterior pituitary gland. Um, the ovarian cycle is divided into two phases. Um, the ovarian cycle is divided into a follicular phase and a luteal phase. Um, the follicular phase is also called the pre-ovulatory phase because this is before ovulation, um, before the egg is released. The luteal phase is called the post-ovulatory phase because that's what happens after the egg is released. Um, and again, you'll see like these terms are very closely related to what's actually happening in um, the ovary at the time. Okay, so in the ovarian um, cycle, inside the ovaries, we have ovarian follicles. Um, ovarian follicles are special little structures in the cortex of the ovaries um, where the oocyte growth and meiosis one occur. Um, there are primary, follicles, secondary follicles, and tertiary follicles. But again, it's just a little specialized structure where the, the egg is going through its cell division. 
um, <clears throat> the primary oocytes, um, like in the ovary, the primary oocytes are located in clusters that are called egg nests. Um, and each primary oocyte in an egg nest is surrounded by follicle cells, right? So in the ovary, there are little egg nests. Inside the egg nest, there's a primary oocyte surrounded by follicle cells, right? Then another primary oocyte surrounded by follicle cells, another primary oocyte surrounded by follicle cells. Um, the combination of the primary oocyte and the follicle cells around it forms the primordial follicle. Okay? Remember, we, we mentioned primordial follicles. Um, it's the primar primordial follicle that grows and develops each month into a primary follicle, then a secondary follicle, then a tertiary follicle. So when the baby is born, the baby has a bunch of primordial follicles in the ovaries. At puberty, that's when we start stimulating a primordial follicle to develop into a primary, secondary, and then tertiary follicle each month. All right, so we're gonna kind of look microscopically at the ovaries to see how that happens, how the primordial follicle gets stimulated and turns into a primary follicle, secondary follicle, and tertiary follicle. Um, and we'll see like that in that process, we end up releasing um, the, the secondary oocyte. Okay, so first here you see the primordial follicle um, in the egg nest. Um, so looking at the primordial follicle, you can see first the primary oocyte surrounded by follicle cells. So the primary oocyte is in the center and then like around the outside of it, we have follicle cells and you see clusters of these, right? So like here, there's another primary oocyte surrounded by follicle cells. So this whole kind of cluster together is an egg nest. So this is what the ovary would look like, like at birth when the baby is born, their eggs, they have just a bunch of primary oocytes in these little um, primordial follicles. The very beginning of follicle development is not very well understood. Um, we know that there are some local hormones that stimulate the primordial follicle to develop into a primary follicle. Um, this could take a long period of time. Like this, this process of developing into a primary follicle could take a year. Um, it's a really slow kind of progression. Um, as this happens, the follicular cells that are around the outside of the primary oocyte, um, those follicular cells around the outside grow and divide and they start to become round cells that are called granulosa cells. Um, and you can see that in the picture here, right? So like the primary oocyte is here, you can see the nucleus in the middle. Um, and then now these granulosa cells are these cells that are going around the outside, really nice and organized around the outside. That looks different than that primordial follicle that the baby is born with. Um, <clears throat> so this, once this happens, once we sell, see the primary oocyte, um, with these granulosa cells around the outside, um, that's the primary follicle. Now, this is not a primordial follicle, this is a primary follicle. Um, also, we see that, um, so like surrounding the, the oocyte, we have a ring of granulosa cells, but then outside of that, we see that the primary follicle is surrounded by fecal cells. Um, fecal cells form like a box around the follicle um, to kind of like support the follicle and to help um, produce estrogens. So we see that these fecal cells are, are important in the production of estrogens and the support of this, the, the primary follicle. Um, so the next step is the formation of a secondary follicle. Um, a lot of primordial cells um, develop into primary follicles. 
but not very many of those are going to ever develop into a secondary follicle. Um, <clears throat> in this step, like of dividing, or uh, in this step of going from a primary follicle to a secondary follicle, um, the wall of the follicle thickens um, and deeper granulosa, granulosa cells start producing a follicular fluid that expands and grows the follicle. Um, <clears throat> so that's like what you can see around the outside now. Um, so instead of just one row of granulosa cells, you can see there's, there's multiple um, rows of granulosa cells and the follicle starts expanding. It starts pushing outward. We still have fecal cells around the outside here, um, but the follicle itself is thickening and expanding. Um, on the inside, right, you can see again, this is the, the oocyte, um, the primary oocyte. The primary oocyte is still developing, like the oocyte continues to grow, but the major reason that the follicle starts to get bigger um, is because the follicle wall is growing, not the oocyte. So the oocyte does develop and grow, um, but it's mostly these granulosa cells that are making the follicle expand. Um, so that, again, is happening during the, the monthly ovarian cycle. Um, again, it takes a long time for primordial follicles to develop into primary follicles. But then monthly, right in this monthly ovarian cycle, we'll see those primary follicles turn into secondary follicles. Then by about eight to 10 days after the start of the ovarian cycle, we'll see that there is just one secondary follicle that will end up going on to be a tertiary follicle. Um, and you can see a tertiary follicle here. Um, by about 10 to 14 days into the cycle, the follicle is going to be a tertiary follicle. So if the ovarian cycle is about a month long, that means like halfway through the cycle, we have a tertiary follicle. Um, the tertiary follicle is large. Um, it spans the entire width of the ovarian cortex. Um, so it's very, very big. Um, <clears throat> when you look at the, the tertiary follicle here, notice the antrum. Um, the antrum is like this, this kind of large kind of curved area that contains follicular fluid. Um, until this stage, the oocyte was a primary oocyte that was just suspended in time. Um, it hadn't developed or hadn't finished meiosis one yet um, <clears throat> and hadn't started meiosis two. So until this time, the, the primary oocyte, it might, you know, grow, but it, it wasn't actually finishing its division. Um, as the tertiary follicle finishes development, we start to see another hormone level rise. We start to see levels of luteinizing hormone um, increase. This increase in luteinizing hormone stimulates the primary oocyte to complete meiosis one and become a secondary oocyte. So that's why here with this tertiary follicle, now you see that this is a secondary oocyte, right? So the kind of key thing here with a tertiary follicle is that the increasing LS, L, sorry, the increasing LH has stimulated our primary oocyte to turn into a secondary oocyte. Um, <clears throat> on day 14 of a 28 day cycle, the secondary oocyte is going to enter into the antrum um, and float inside it. And so halfway through a 28 day cycle, day 14 of a 28 day cycle, so halfway through the cycle, the secondary oocyte enters into the antrum. The next stage in the ovarian cycle is ovulation. Ovulation. Um, 
In ovulation, the secondary oocyte, right, which is, remember, in the middle of meiosis two. So it finished meiosis one, it starts meiosis two. This secondary oocyte, um, paused in the middle of meiosis two, is going to get um, released into the pelvic cavity. So it gets released from the ovary into the pelvic cavity. Um, and that's what you see happening right here. Um, the, remember that the secondary oocyte went into that antrum, it went into that fluid. So as this follicle um, merges with the, the capsule of the ovary, um, that fluid of the antrum and the, the egg itself, this, or the secondary oocyte itself, gets released into the pelvic cavity. Um, the oocyte should be brought up into the uterine tube um, in the hopes that fertilization will then occur, that there will be sperm present to fertilize the egg. Um, <clears throat> here you can actually see that happening. Um, you can see here the secondary oocyte is being released. You can see the follicular fluid from the antrum, um, you know, being released with it um, out of the ovary. Um, if you look at this top picture here, thus far we've been through this, this like top half of the ovarian cycle. We started with these primordial follicles. Those are there when the baby is born. Um, those have primary oocytes that are in the middle of meiosis one, um, just surrounded by little follicle cells. Um, over time, these primordial follicles slowly turn into a primary follicle. Then, um, you know, we see that with the monthly ovarian cycle, we'll see some primary follicles develop into secondary follicles. Okay, you can see the follicle starts to, to get thicker and bigger, it grows and develops. We see fluid starting to um, kind of accumulate here in the granulosa cells. Then we'll see that one of these secondary follicles develops into a tertiary follicle. Um, by, um, like as we progress towards the middle of the cycle, our primary oocyte will develop into a secondary oocyte. And by you know, the middle of the cycle, that secondary oocyte will enter into the antrum, this fluid of the tertiary follicle. On day 14 at ovulation, this secondary oocyte gets released from the ovary. That is ovulation. Um, now what we're gonna look at is what happens afterwards because we still have all of this, these cells, right? We have all of you know, the, the granulosa cells and all of this stuff left over from the follicle. Not all of that gets released from the ovary. Some of that is retained in the ovary. So we'll see what happens with it, um, you know, as it progresses to a corpus luteum and then a corpus albicans. So now in the ovary, um, a corpus luteum is formed. Um, luteinizing hormone stimulates this process. So remember, initially it was FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, that was stimulating the development of the follicle, right? So like the primary follicle into the secondary follicle and tertiary follicle. Then we started to see an increase in luteinizing hormone. Um, that increase in luteinizing hormone that we saw is what caused um, the primary oocyte to turn into a secondary oocyte, and then that was released. Um, it's this increase in luteinizing hormone that also stimulates the formation of the corpus luteum. Um, the empty tertiary follicle, right, the tertiary follicle released its, its the fluid of the antrum and the egg. So now you just have the, a bunch of granulosa cells with nothing in them or nothing, you know, in the middle of the follicle. So the empty tertiary follicle collapses in and the granulosa cells proliferate, um, they, they, you know, divide, and they form an endocrine structure called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum manufactures um, steroid hormones called progestins, 
So specifically, we see progesterone being released from this corpus luteum. Okay, so luteinizing hormone stimulates, um, which comes from the anterior pituitary gland, stimulates the production of this corpus luteum, and this corpus luteum produces progesterone, right? Progestins, mainly progesterone. So progesterone is the main hormone of this phase, of the luteal phase. Um, estrogen was the main hormone of the follicular phase. Okay. So um, the main function of the progesterone is to prepare the uterus for pregnancy. Um, <clears throat> because remember, we just released an egg. So we just released this egg and we're counting on this egg being um, fertilized. And if the egg is fertilized, it's gonna need to implant in the uterus. So um, in the ovary, what we do is we release the egg and then we're like, okay, we're gonna keep trying to do our part by producing this progesterone. The progesterone again goes to the uterus and it stimulates the development of the uterine lining, um, the endometrium and the uterine glands in order to be able to accept um, the fertilized egg. Okay. Um, unless fertilization of the egg occurs, then the corpus luteum will degenerate, it'll, it'll break down about 12 days after ovulation. So um, the corpus luteum breaks down and becomes this little like knot of leftover scar tissue called the corpus um, albicans. So again, it takes about 12 days for this to happen. Um, so if there's no um, fertilization of the egg, um, the corpus luteum breaks down to the corpus albicans, and that means that progesterone levels will fall. Um, estrogen levels fall as well. Um, so we see like a big drop in estrogen levels and progesterone levels. Um, <clears throat> and later we'll see like how that ends up impacting what's happening in the uterus. Um, but the, the degradation of the corpus luteum into the corpus albicans um, marks the end of the ovarian cycle. And then we'll see that this will repeat again when we start to stimulate another follicle to develop. And you know, we go through the whole thing, the follicle develops into a secondary follicle and then a tertiary follicle, and then we release the egg. And then the corpus luteum um, is you know, produced from the leftover follicular cells. It makes progesterone. Um, and then it degrades into the corpus albicans, and then the whole thing repeats again. So that's the ovary. Okay, that's what's happening in the ovary continuously. So the ovaries, again, support the developing um, eggs and then release the egg. The ovaries also, remember, are producing hormones, right? We have estrogen coming from the fecal cells, and then we have progesterone coming from the cells, the granulosa cells in the corpus luteum. Um, <clears throat> and this happens in a cyclical fashion. Now we'll talk about the uterus and what happens in the uterus. Um, the uterus is the organ that provides for the developing embryo um, and fetus. So technically, like the cells that are dividing um, during weeks one through eight, this is referred to as an embryo. Um, weeks nine through delivery are referred to as a fetus. Um, and then once the baby's born, it's a neonate for the first month um, and then an infant thereafter. Um, <clears throat> so while the uterus has this developing embryo and fetus, the uterus provides just actual physical protection of the um, the embryo and fetus. Um, it it you know at the cervix it helps to support and hold the the baby in the um, uterus. Um, it has a, a you know strong muscular wall to provide protection around it. So just physical protection. 
Um, the uterus also provides nutritional support to the baby um, via the placenta. Um, the placenta is a very vascular structure where the mother's blood is able to come and mix with the baby's blood so that the nutrients from the mom's blood are able to cross over to the fetus's blood um, to provide nutrients to the fetus, um, as well as um, you know, blood that's rich in uh, respiratory gases or rich in oxygen. Um, and the uterus allows for waste removal from the fetus. When we look at the uterine wall, um, <clears throat> you guys will remember from lab that the uterine wall, the wall of the uterus, has three layers. Um, the endometrium, myometrium, and parametrium. Um, <clears throat> the myometrium is a thick middle layer of muscle. This is smooth muscle. Myo means muscle. So myometrium is the layer of smooth muscle. This is the layer that contracts during childbirth to you know, expel the fetus from the uterus. So that those, those contractions that hurt during childbirth are contractions of the myometrium. Um, <clears throat> the thin inner layer that's a, a very glandular um, mucosa is called the endometrium. Endo means within, so endometrium is the, the inner layer. Um, the parametrium is the outermost layer. Peri means around, so this is the outer layer that goes around the uterus. Um, <clears throat> this is a relatively thin um, layer. It's just a serous membrane that's continuous with the peritoneum. Um, <clears throat> the parametrium covers the fundus and a posterior surface of the uterine body as well as the isthmus. Um, so this is not, does not like extend down around the cervix and the interior surface of the uterine body. Um, again, it's just a really, really thin outermost layer. So um, <clears throat> we'll talk in a bit more detail about the layers. Um, again, the myometrium is um, the thick layer of smooth muscle. Um, this is the thickest portion of the uterine wall. It constitutes about 90% of the actual mass of the uterus, so most of the uterus is actually muscle in the myometrium. Um, the muscle in the myometrium is arranged into three different layers, um, and the layers are going in you know, different directions. There's a longitudinal layer of muscle, a circular layer of muscle, and then an oblique layer that goes out a diagonal. Again, the, the major function of the myometrium is to provide the, the force contraction that's necessary to push the fetus out of the uterus and into the vagina or the lower part of the birth canal um, during birth. And the myometrium does this, it contracts in response to oxytocin, um, the hormone that comes from the posterior pituitary gland um, during birth. And remember, this is an, a rare example of positive feedback where um, you know oxytocin is released and it stimulates a contraction. And then the sensation from that contraction stimulates the release of more oxytocin. Then that causes a stronger contraction. The sensation from that causes the release of more oxytocin. And there's this positive feedback loop where we get more and more and more oxytocin and stronger and stronger and stronger contractions until the baby is actually expelled um, from the womb. The endometrium contributes to about 10% of the uterine mass, um, which 90% plus 10%, that's 100%, which should make you realize that the parametrium is very, very small, a um, very thin layer that doesn't even cover the entire uterus. So the endometrium is about 10% of uterine mass. Again, this is the innermost layer. Um, this is a highly glandular and highly vascular area that supports the physiological demands of the growing fetus. Um, estrogen and progesterone, the female sex hormones, 
are the hormones that cause the uterine glands, the blood vessels, and the epithelium to change with the phases of the monthly uterine cycle. So the endometrium is constantly going through, um, you know, different phases or changes throughout the uterine cycle. This is the phase that gets built up um, in order to accept a fertilized egg. And then if a fertilized egg does not implant, it gets shed. Um, and then it gets built up again. If nothing happens, it gets shed. <clears throat> when we look at the endometrium, um, there are two divisions or parts to the endometrium. Um, <clears throat> the inner area is the functional zone, and then the deep part of it is the basilar zone. So the innermost layer, or what I mean by innermost is like the, the superficial layer, the part that's actually near the surface, that's near the, the uterine cavity, um, is the functional zone. So again, functional zones closest to the uterine cavity. This is the part that would actually you know, come in contact with like where the baby is um, or where the fetus is. This is the part that contains most of the uterine glands and contributes most to the thickness of the endometrium. Um, the functional zone is the zone that actually undergoes these dramatic changes in thickness and structure um, during the menstrual cycle. So this is the functional area. This is the part that gets built up really thick and then gets shed. Gets built up really thick and then gets shed. Deep to that, so like underneath that deeper, we have um, the basilar zone, which makes sense, right? Base is like the bottom of it. Um, the basilar zone is the part that attaches the rest of the endometrium to the myometrium. Um, this contains the terminal branches of um, the, the vessels that are present, um, the terminal branches of the, the ducts of the glands that are present, um, et cetera. Okay, so here you can see um, microscopically uh, the uterine wall. So this here, this open space, this is the uterine cavity. So that's the open area inside the uterus. Um, so if we had a fertilized egg, this is where it would implant. Um, you can see there's a simple columnar epithelium lining the surface. All open areas are lined with a layer of epithelial tissue. Um, <clears throat> this whole area here is the endometrium. So again, the endometrium lines the uterine cavity. You can see that it's broken up into a functional zone and then a basilar zone. The functional zone is most of the thickness. We've got a bunch of uterine glands that produce you know, mucus. Um, <clears throat> is this, again, most of the thickness is the functional zone. And then there's just a thin little layer that connects it to the myometrium. Um, the myometrium, again, is this layer of muscle that's deep to that. And then there's a thin parametrium outside of that. So before we, we said that the female reproductive system functions with two interconnected cycles, the ovarian cycle, what's happening in the ovary, and then the uterine cycle is what's happening in the uterus. We already talked about the ovarian cycle, right? We said we've got this follicle that develops, we release the secondary oocyte, then what's left over from the follicle turns into um, corpus luteum, and then um, corpus albicans, and then we start over. And we talked about how there's estrogen, and then about halfway through, we start having progesterone, and then we see a drop in both hormones. Um, <clears throat> now we'll talk about the uterine cycle, what happens in the uterus. Um, the uterine cycle is typically called the menstrual cycle because it has to do with menstruation. Um, <clears throat> the uterine cycle or menstrual cycle is a repeating series of changes that occur each month in the endometrium of the uterus. Um, during the uterine cycle, the endometrial changes occur almost entirely in the functional zone. 
of the uterus or the functional zone of the endometrium. Um, that's the superficial zone that's, you know, out towards the cavity wall or towards the cavity. The basilar zone underneath really remains mostly unchanged. Um, so it's, it's just the superficial zone that gets built up and then shed, built up and then shed, which makes sense. Um, the uterine cycle lasts between 21 and 35 days um, with, you know, the average typical woman's cycle being about 28 days. And that matches what we saw with the ovarian cycle. Because again, the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle go hand in hand. They affect each other. Um, the uterine cycle is caused by hormones that are produced during the ovarian cycle. In the ovarian cycle, remember we saw that estrogen was produced and progesterone was produced. So the estrogen and progesterone that come from the ovaries are what cause the changes in the uterus. Um, <clears throat> there are three phases of the uterine cycle. Um, menses, the um, proliferative phase. Um, so those are the first two. The first two menses in the proliferative phase, those occur in conjunction with the ovarian follicular phase. So like while the follicle is developing, um, we have menses and the proliferative phase occur. The secretory phase um, in the uterus occurs during the ovarian luteal phase. Okay, so menses and proliferation are happening when the follicle is developing, and then the secretory phase is happening um, when the corpus luteum is formed, and then when that degrades into the corpus albicans. We'll see a, you know, when it degrades into the corpus albicans, we'll see we kind of go back and start over with menses. Okay, so the uterine cycle begins with the onset of menses. Um, menses is the degeneration of the functional zone um, of the endometrium. So the endometrium degrades when the corpus luteum dissipates and the levels of estrogen and progesterone decrease. Um, they drop dramatically at the end of the ovarian cycle. So um, again, remember we were like building up in order to accept a fertilized egg. If we don't get a fertilized egg, there's not a huge amount of hormones, the amount of hormones drop. And then, so in the uterus, we're like, okay, there was no point in me building this up. Let me go ahead and shed this functional zone. So that's menses. Um, <clears throat> uh, again, this, this correlates with the, the breakdown of the corpus luteum and the drop of hormones. In the uterus, what happens is spiral arteries um, constrict and reduce blood flow um, and oxygen and nutrients that were being delivered to the functional zone of the endometrium. So spiral arteries constrict. We don't have um, you know, nutrients and, and oxygen going to the functional zone. So this results in weakened artery walls in the area and the rupture and release of blood into the functional zone tissues. Um, the tissues will start to you know, break down and degenerate um, because they don't have good blood supply anymore. If the tissues don't have good blood supply, they degenerate and they start to break away from the the uterine wall and enter into the uterine cavity. Um, <clears throat> the tissue and blood leave the uterine cavity um, and exit through the vagina. So there's blood and tissue that breaks away from the uterine wall into the cavity and then out through the cervix and through the vagina. Um, the entire functional zone is lost by the end of menses, okay? but only the functional zone is affected. So the basilar zone of the endometrium is not affected, but the whole functional zone is lost during menses. And again, this marks the beginning of the uterine cycle. So we get rid of what was there 
um, at the beginning of the uterine cycle. Menstruation is this process of endometrial, you know, sloughing. I don't like that word, but shedding of, you know, the endometrial lining um, is menstruation or menses. Um, menses typically lasts between one and seven days, so up to about a week. Um, and on average, a woman will shed um, between 35 and 50 milliliters of blood and tissue um, via the vagina. The next phase of the uterine cycle is the proliferative phase. So we have menses where we shed the endometrium. Then we have the proliferative phase. During the proliferative phase, the epithelial cells of the uterine glands multiply and spread across the endometrial surface. Um, and they restore the epithelium of the uterus, which remember has just been shed um, completely. Um, <clears throat> the area continues to proliferate um, and you know, grow until the functional zone is completely restored. Um, <clears throat> and remember, this is all occurring at the same time that the enlargement of the primary and secondary follicles is occurring in the ovary, right? So the primary and secondary follicles are enlarging. Um, there's a good amount of, of estrogen coming from the ovary um, and that is stimulating this development and proliferation of the functional zone of the endometrium. Um, again, I just mentioned this, um, but those ovarian follicles that are developing, right, the primary follicle, secondary follicle, those are secreting estrogens. So estrogen levels are increasing throughout this period. Um, <clears throat> that rising estrogen is what's stimulating the proliferative phase um, or proliferation of the endometrium. Right, this is really logical. Right? The egg is developing in the ovary, and we want to ensure that the uterus is ready when that egg gets released. We want the uterus to prepare for the egg so that after the egg is fertilized, the uterus can accept it. Right? So as the um, follicle develops, as the egg develops, it's releasing a hormone that stimulates the uterus um, you know, to, de to develop. Um, the entire functional zone is very highly vascularized. Um, the, this comes from the arteries in the myometrium. Um, there are large arteries in the muscle of the myometrium and they branch, you know, they branch and branch and branch to form smaller arteries um, that spiral off and towards the inner surface of the uterus. Um, <clears throat> And that ends up giving us this, this highly vascularized endometrium. Um, this is what the uterus looks like um, during the proliferative phase. So there are lots of uterine glands that are multiplying um, in a nice solid functional zone. Um, so you see like this is the myometrium, we have this little basilar zone, and then this is the functional zone Again, thickening, developing, there's a lot of, of uterine glands um, that are producing you know, mucus for the mucosa, um, and the endometrium is thickening. So we had menses where we shed the old lining, and then um, there's you know, an increase in estrogen. As the follicle develops, estrogen levels start to go up, and that causes the proliferative phase where the inside of the, the endometrium you know, develops and proliferates and thickens. Then the final phase um, in the over, oh, sorry, in the uterine cycle is the secretory phase. Um, the secretory phase begins at ovulation and it persists as long as the corpus luteum remains intact. Um, typically, this lasts around 14 days, 
Um, so like days 15 through 28 of a normal 28 day cycle. Right? The average cycle is 28 days. So the secretory phase is the last half um, of the cycle. So during this phase, um, endometrial glands enlarge um, and this increases the rate um, of secretion. Um, <clears throat> so um, we start seeing, again, like glands get bigger and they're really secreting a lot. Um, arteries of the uterine wall elongate and spiral through the functional zone. So again, we see very extensive vessel growth occurring. Um, <clears throat> the, in, in general, um, there's a lot of gland secretion and a lot of vessels present in the endometrium. Um, again, because we're, we're hoping that the fertilized egg is going to come and plant. Um, <clears throat> um, so there's, there's really very extensive vessel growth in this phase. This phase is highly focused on a bunch of vessels coming into the area. Because if we have a fertilized egg, the, the baby is going to need a huge blood supply um, um, in the area. So um, the secretory phase is, um, or in the uterus, is essentially the uterus further preparing to accept and nourish an embryo. Um, and this occurs as long as the corpus luteum is producing progesterone. Um, when the corpus luteum stops producing progesterone, the uterus knows that fertilization did not occur, um, and then the secretory phase ends. So this ends as the corpus luteum degrades, turns into the corpus albicans, and we stop getting that, that progesterone from the corpus luteum. So there's a big drop in hormones when the corpus luteum degrades. Um, we don't have, you know, the estrogen and progesterone that we've had stimulating this whole process. Um, and when we have this big drop in hormones, that leads us back to the first phase, which was menses, right? There's a drop in hormones that leads to menses or the shedding of the uterine lining, which was the very beginning of the uterine cycle. Um, this is what the uterus looks like during the secretory phase. Um, you can see the functional zone is uh, much thicker. The functional zone is, is really thick. Um, also, the glands are huge. The glands are very large and very numerous. So like whenever, wherever you see these open areas, those are the glands. So the cells that, that line the open area, those are producing secretions like mucus, and that's getting released up and into the uterine cavity. So there's tons of open areas, like there's just glands everywhere. Um, <clears throat> this would be really, really vascular too. Um, again, the purpose is just preparing the uterus to try and accept an egg if it's fertilized. Um, a fertilized egg will implant into the lining of the uterus. Like that's what happens. If the egg gets fertilized, it'll come into the uterus and implant into this endometrium. Um, a thick, vascular, soft endometrium accepts the fertilized egg better. Um, and in this picture here, you can see now that the endometrium is very thick. This inner lining has gotten, you know, much thicker. Okay, so um, we've talked about both, you know, the uterine cycle and the ovarian cycle uh, in a lot of detail. Um, we'll finish up with just a couple terms that are related to um, menses um, and, you know, the uterine cycle uh, and the female reproductive system. So first is menarch. Um, menarch is the first uterine cycle that occurs at the onset of puberty. Um, this typically occurs in like 
around age 11 and 12, uh, when again, we start, you know, getting pulse, um, pulsatile releases of um, FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary gland. Um, what happens is at puberty, we don't really know what sets this off, but at puberty, we start to get pulses of um, GnRH from the hypothalamus, um, gonadotropin releasing hormone, and GnRH from the hypothalamus goes to the anterior pituitary gland, um, and we see it causing the release of FSH um, and LH. Um, you guys know, you know the effects of FSH, um, LH as far as you know, stimulating follicle development um, and stimulating the development of the corpus, um, the corpus luteum. Um, <clears throat> so again, we get these released pulsatile right fashion. Um, and when this first begins, again, around the ages of 11 or 12, that very first uterine cycle that, that occurs is menarche. Menopause is the opposite. Um, menopause is the termination of the uterine cycle. So um, the average age for menopause to occur is um, somewhere between the ages of 45 and 55. Um, and at menop menopause is usually a process. Um, it's not like all of a sudden overnight, um, you know, the woman goes through menopause and it's done. The uterine cycle is completely over. There's no more menses that occurs and hormone levels drop and that's it. It's normally a process um, where over time, um, you know, the frequency of menses will decrease um, and hormone levels decrease over a period of time. Um, but we do see that, you know, through menopause and after menopause, the amount of estrogen and progesterone in a woman goes down greatly. Um, and this affects a lot of things. Um, this affects bone health, for example. We see big decreases in bone density. We see some decreases in muscle mass that can occur after menopause. Um, and there are all sorts of other symptoms that, that women kind of suffer through going through menopause. I think, you know, hot flashes. Um, are you know, the common thing that people think of, but there is a dysregulation in, in temperature control that can occur. Um, there are some emotional aspects. Um, there can be some decreases in functioning of the, the female reproductive tract. Um, because of the decreases in estrogen and progesterone, we can see the decreases in lubrication of the vagina, um, <clears throat> um, various, various other symptoms occur. Um, amenorrhea is a lack of menses, so or a lack of a menstrual cycle. So amenorrhea um, is when there is no menstrual cycle occurring. Um, this can happen for different reasons, but primary amenorrhea is a failure to initiate menses. So this would be the diagnosis in a patient who has never had a menstrual cycle before. Um, even though they're well past the age for typical menarche. So, um, you know, if you have a patient who is 16 years old and she has never had a menstrual cycle, then you would diagnose her with primary amenorrhea because by 16, she should have um, started having that menstrual cycle. Um, secondary amenorrhea um, is a lack of a menstrual cycle that occurs after they have had a, a menstrual cycle in the past. Um, <clears throat> so this is, you know, somebody has a normal menstrual cycle and then for whatever reason, it stops. Um, so this is an interruption in the menstrual cycle of um, six months or more. Um, and obviously when somebody is pregnant, um, they have a stop in the menstrual cycle, um, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about, you know, some other cause um, that's, you know, causing their, their uterine cycle to not occur, so they're not menstruating. Um, this can be caused by physical stress or emotional stress. Um, there are a lot of different, um, you know, things or 
causes of secondary amenorrhea. Um, a couple of common physical causes have to do with like the makeup of the body and tissues overall um, and a lack of adipose tissue or a lack of fat tissue. Um, inadequate nutrition, um, very, very low weight and low body fat um, can all lead to secondary amenorrhea. Um, and we see very low body weight and low fat in anorexia. Um, so patients who have severe anorexia nervosa, um, you know, we're, we're, that's the disorder where patients don't eat at all. Um, <clears throat> this is very commonly associated with a lack of menstrual cycle. Um, intense physical exercise and very high muscle mass as seen in some professional athletes is another cause um, for secondary amenorrhea. Um, and the reasons here with both of these have to do with hormonal imbalances. Um, fat tissue converts androgens into estrogens. So androgens are the male sex hormones. So like testosterone, for example, is an androgen. Um, estrogens are the female sex hormones. So females have androgens, like females do have testosterone present, um, but some of that testosterone gets converted into estrogen. And again, that happens in fat tissue. So if there's a complete lack of adipose tissue, if there's a complete lack of fat tissue, that can lead to a decrease in estrogen. Um, and that decrease in estrogen can interrupt menses. It can interrupt that, that normal cycle. Um, so that's why like with anorexia, for example, um, we can see um, secondary amenorrhea. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and stop there. Go ahead and shoot me an email or post if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, I'll see you guys next week.